Thanks for wasting our time today. I understand this is a marriage proposal, but we don't approve. Please give up and go home now. That's what his mom said to me when we went to his family's house to announce our engagement. She gave me a cold glare and spoke down to me like I didn't belong. I knew from the start that his parents didn't like me, but I couldn't turn back. I took a deep breath, braced myself, and introduced myself anyway. My name is Cheryl. I'm 29 years old, and I work in the general affairs department of a manufacturing company. I've been dating my boyfriend, James, since last year. He's four years older than me, and we work in the same department. James has a gentle look, and his kindness shows whenever he smiles. That's what made me fall in love with him. We both live on our own, so we often spend time at each other's places and enjoy weekends together. We've built a happy relationship. My parents live nearby, so I take James to their house often. They really like him, and whenever he visits, they go all out with meals. James and my dad get along great, and I thought everything would go smoothly when we got married. But James had always hesitated to introduce me to his parents. When I asked him why, he looked uncomfortable. Could you wait a little longer? My parents aren't like yours. I wish I had grown up with parents like yours, he said with a sad expression. I wondered if he had issues with his family, but I decided to give him time. I wasn't in a hurry to get married, so I figured it would be better for him to open up when he was ready. But things don't always go as planned. One holiday, James and I were on our way to our favorite restaurant when something unexpected happened. As the staff showed us to our table, James suddenly seemed nervous and fidgety. What's wrong? I asked, noticing how tense he was. He looked away, unsure how to explain, clearly struggling to find the words. I felt nervous at that moment, wondering if I had done something wrong. Just then, a woman in her 53s came over to our table and spoke to James cheerfully. Oh, James, I haven't heard from you in a while. I was wondering what you were up to, she said. She then turned to look at me, her eyes narrowing as if she was judging me. She had downturned eyes that made it seem like she was glaring. Her hair was neatly tied back, which made her sharp eyes stand out even more. As I gave her a confused look, she let out a little laugh, but it wasn't friendly. Are you really spending time with someone like her, James? You're such a good kid. If you don't like it, you need to tell her. Otherwise, girls like her won't get the message, she said. James's face tightened in anger. He glared at the woman and firmly said, I won't allow you to insult her. But the woman gave me a cold look and said, It's a shame my son has been tricked by a girl like you. Leave him alone right now. After that, she went to the cashier, paid her bill, and left the diner. What just happened? I asked, still in shock. James replied in a low voice, That was my mother. A few years ago, because of her, I had to end a relationship with someone I was thinking of marrying. She didn't want to marry me because of my mom's behavior. I began to understand why she had acted that way. James continued, If you choose to stay with me, there will be a lot of challenges. Maybe we should break up now. Don't worry, I'll keep things professional at work and I'll make sure it doesn't cause you any trouble. He looked really upset and it pained me to see him like that. But I calmly said, I still want to be with you, James. Do you really want to end things with me? James seemed surprised by my words. You know what my mother is like. If you marry me, she will be a burden to you. I don't mind. I think that's part of marriage, and we don't have to live with her, right? If it becomes an issue, I'll ask for a transfer at work, and we can move far away, I said. James stared at me, deeply considering my words, and I gave him a reassuring smile. Then I feel better about it. Is it strange if I propose to you right now, he asked. A wave of warmth rushed through me, and I could feel my face turning red. Are you serious? I asked, feeling a bit embarrassed. Yes, of course. I want to spend my life with you. I said, my cheeks growing hotter. I feel a bit like you've beat me to it, but I'm really happy. I want to be with you forever, James said with a smile, and I finally felt relieved. After that, we decided to tell my parents about our engagement. They were thrilled and asked how we decided to get married. I knew we'd have to mention James's mom at some point, but we tried to avoid the topic by pretending to be shy. However, my mother wouldn't let it go. So, have you already met James's parents? 
Or is that still in the works? She asked. James and I were caught off guard. No, I don't plan to tell my parents about the wedding, James said, causing my mom to gasp in surprise. Why not? She asked, shocked. Because I know they won't approve of our marriage, James explained. At that point, my father gave us a serious look. That's not acceptable. Marriage is the joining of two families. Your mother would be heartbroken if she found out you got married without her knowing. You both should at least meet with them once. If they still refuse, come talk to us and we'll support you. My dad's words were strong and comforting, but James still looked worried. I'm fine, I said with a smile, hoping to put him at ease. I thought that if we couldn't get past this challenge, we wouldn't be able to find real happiness together. Later, James told his parents that I would be coming to introduce myself. They didn't seem excited, but he was able to set up the meeting anyway. James's father was a CEO, and they lived in a big house with a large yard. When I stepped in, a big dog started barking. James smiled and petted the dog's chin, calming him down, and then the dog let me pet him too. While we were playing with the dog, the front door opened and his parents came out. His mother had a sharp look that made her seem intimidating, and his father looked just as stern as he stared down at me. Don't touch our dog, you're disgusting, were the first words his father said to me, without even a hello. He started scolding me right away, and I felt really uncomfortable. How dare you talk to her like that? If you keep acting like this, I won't hesitate to cut ties with you, James said firmly. His parents gave me angry looks but didn't say anything else unpleasant after that. They invited us into the house. As we walked in, I found it a little strange. Looking at James's face, you'd think he's a kind person because of his gentle eyes, but he didn't look anything like his father. His mother had upturned eyes, but he didn't take after her either. Sometimes traits skip a generation, or kids don't look like their parents at all, so I decided not to think too much about it. Once inside, as I was looking around, a middle-aged man in a suit appeared. Mr. Eric, welcome home, young master, he said, bowing to greet James. He had a kind smile that was contagious, and I couldn't help but smile back. It's been a while, Mr. Eric, James said. You've grown up so much, young master, Mr. Eric replied, smiling warmly at James. It was the first time I saw James truly smile since we arrived. Then James introduced me to him. This is Mr. Eric, my father's right-hand man. Honestly, he's more like a father to me than my real dad. My father never paid much attention to me, so Mr. Eric was the one who took care of me. You're the boss's son. I was just doing my job, Mr. Eric said modestly. But you've always had a soft spot for me, haven't you? James added with a smile. I like you more than my father. James joked with a chuckle, his laugh making me smile for the first time in what felt like forever. As we were talking, his mother suddenly stormed in from the back of the house. Cheryl, what do you think you're doing? Get over here now, she yelled angrily. She shot a harsh look at Mr. Eric. What are you doing here, slacking off? How many times have I told you to stay away from Cheryl? I'll make sure my husband knows about this. Now, get back to work, Mr. Eric nodded and replied. I understand. I'll do as you say. He then left the room. I couldn't help but wonder if being the CEO's secretary meant you had to deal with orders from the wife at home, too. James glared at his mother and spoke up. Why do you always treat Mr. Eric so poorly? How can you be so rude to someone who's worked so hard for dad? Quiet. You should just listen to your parents. I'll handle that man. Now, both of you, come over here. We followed her to the living room, where James and I sat on the sofa across from his parents. His mother was the first to speak. Thanks for wasting our time today. I understand you're here to get our blessing, but we don't approve of this marriage. Just give up and go home, she said coldly. I was ready for the rude comments so they didn't bother me as much as they could have. I calmly responded, No, thank you for making time to meet with us. James and I love each other, and it's natural for two people in love to get married, don't you think, father, mother? I smiled politely, but my mother-in-law let out an exaggerated sigh. You really don't understand marriage, do you? She said with a mocking tone. Since our last meeting, I've looked into you. You're a very average woman graduated from an ordinary school, working at a small company. 
Despite having no real skills, you've managed to trap my James, haven't you? Do you really think someone like you is a good match for our family? In marriage, what matters is a good match. Mom, James interrupted, Cheryl and I work at the same company, doing the same job. If you think she's not good enough, then neither am I. We are a perfect match. You're different, James, his mother snapped back. There must be a reason you chose that company, but this woman didn't have any other choice. And, she added with a smirk, turning her sharp gaze toward me, it seems like you come from a poor family. After our money, are you? My blood boiled at my mother-in-law's comments. I had promised myself I wouldn't let anything she said get to me, but when she insulted my parents, I couldn't hold back. I snapped. Don't assume we're poor. Oh, what's wrong with telling the truth, she sneered. You live in an old, rundown house that's over 53 years old and drive a car from a decade ago. Did I strike a nerve? I'm just saying what's obvious. This is why I can't stand poor people. My family home was built by my great-grandfather, a carpenter. It's special to us. And as for the car, we like it and take good care of it. That doesn't make us poor. You did your research, right? So, you must know what my parents do for a living. I responded, trying to stay calm. Yes, I know. Your father is a university professor, and your mother is a high school teacher. They have respectable jobs, but there's still a big difference between our families, she replied. James is going to take over his father's business one day. Don't think for a second that the daughter of mere educators is good enough to marry my son. She laughed loudly, clearly enjoying herself. Just then, James stood up. His face, normally gentle, had turned into something I had never seen before cold and furious. This is pointless. I'm cutting ties with you. I can't forgive you for insulting someone I care about. Cheryl, let's go. There's no reason to stay here anymore, he said, grabbing my hand as we left the house. I'm sorry, he said quietly as we walked away. I'll explain everything to your parents. Please don't say you won't marry me. I nodded, unable to speak. We went straight to my parents' house and told them what had happened. James had anticipated something like this might happen, so he had brought a voice recorder. Everything his mother said was recorded. After listening, my parents thought for a moment and then spoke. Yes, the way his mother talked was awful, but you two are giving up too easily. We'll help you come up with a plan. So keep preparing for the wedding, my father said. If you've both decided to marry, you don't need their approval. But it would still be better if you could get James's parents' blessing, my mother added calmly. Hearing their words gave us hope, and we nodded in agreement. We decided to leave the situation with James's parents to my family and focus on planning our future together. Two months later, my parents called us and James and I visited my family home. When we arrived, we saw James's parents and Mr. Eric sitting around a small table. As we joined them, the room felt a bit crowded. I thought James's parents might make rude comments again, but they stayed quiet. My father was the one who filled us in on what had been discussed while we were away. James's parents looked into our family, so we decided to do some investigating as well. My father began. His parents married 32 years ago after his mother became pregnant. At that time, his father had just started his company. Mr. Eric, who was an ordinary employee back then, supported his father with dedication. As my father continued, James interrupted, That's all well known in our family. Mr. Eric started as a regular employee but was promoted to my father's personal assistant because of his hard work. My mother mostly raised me on her own while my father struggled to manage the company. It seems Mr. Eric supported not just my dad but my mom, too. My father nodded, acknowledging James's words. Then he said, Mr. Eric did indeed support your family with great dedication. Now, let me shift the conversation a bit. I'm a genetic researcher at the university. Genetically, children inherit half of their DNA from each parent. Even if a child looks very different from their parents, they still receive half of their genes from each one. James gave my father a puzzled look, and I was also confused about where he was going with this. My usually calm father had a serious expression as he addressed James's parents. Please listen carefully. I hired a detective to conduct a background check on your family. Your father works hard, and Mr. Eric has always been there to help. 
Your mother is fully devoted to housework, it's quite admirable. But when I looked at your family photos, something didn't add up. Neither of your parents have a widow's peak, but you, James, do. This trait is dominant, meaning a child with a widow's peak can only inherit it from a parent who also has one. And don't you think James looks quite a bit like Mr. Eric? Especially with the drooping eyes and widow's peak? That's why I called your parents here today to discuss this. As my father finished explaining, James looked at his parents and Mr. Eric in shock, unsure of what to say. I am a French teacher, just like my mother, and I'm good at French. I never noticed anything different about their foreheads, and even if I did, I'm no expert in genetics. After a long silence, James's father finally spoke. Forty years ago, I was so focused on my work that I neglected my family completely. Then my wife told me she was pregnant. What she didn't know was that I had been hiding my infertility from her. When I found out about her affair, I was furious, and she was just as angry at me for keeping my infertility a secret. After a huge argument, I told her that if I raised her child as my own, I would forgive her. In return, she promised to forgive me for hiding the truth. I made Mr. Eric my personal assistant to keep him close, hoping to stop any further affair between them. After spilling everything, James's father sat there, looking empty, as if all the life had drained from him. Meanwhile, James's mother started to cry. I loved Mr. Eric. I wanted to raise James with him, she sobbed. James is a precious child I had with the man I truly loved. I can't let him marry someone I don't even know. I absolutely won't allow this marriage. As she wiped her tears and glared at me, James gave her a cold, disgusted look. I've always known, Dad, that you never truly loved me, and I've felt Mom's strange obsession with me for years. I even wish sometimes that Mr. Eric was my real father. But now, hearing all of this you three are disgusting. Mom, I don't want to see you as my parents anymore. Even if Mr. Eric is my biological father, I won't acknowledge him either. I won't forgive any of you. I'm cutting ties with all of you and marrying into Cheryl's family, James said firmly. At his words, his mother jumped up, clinging to him, crying. No, James, you can't. You're mine. I won't let you go, especially not to some common girl. We can live together. I'll allow your marriage, but don't say you're leaving us. As she grabbed onto James's arm, I swatted her hand away. Ma'am, please stop. James is clearly uncomfortable. Do you even realize how much pain you've caused him? Probably not, because all you care about is yourself. If you had just betrayed your husband to be with Mr. Eric, that's one thing, but you've continued to deceive James and hurt him for years. I didn't want to say anything at first, because it's a matter between you three, but I can't just sit here and let you ruin James's happiness. Why don't you put his happiness first? If you don't like me, that's fine, but if you're only trying to control him, you're failing as a mother. From now on, I'll make James happy, so please don't stand in our way. After I said that, his mother started crying again, calling me cruel, but Mr. Eric was there to comfort her. We decided to talk about the future later. A few days later, James's parents officially apologized to us and my parents. They finally accepted our marriage, and James and I turned in our marriage certificate. James moved into my house, and we started our life together. In the end, James's father couldn't forgive his wife's affair. Even though it was too late to ask for compensation, they divorced and split their assets. Mr. Eric also resigned and moved far away with James's mother. Her luxurious life came to an end, and she was forced to live the kind of life she always looked down on. She sometimes sends letters asking James for money, but he ignores them. He has cut all ties with his father since they aren't biologically related, and he has no intention of becoming Mr. Eric's adopted son. Legally, he's still his father's son, but they seem to have accepted that. After Mr. Eric resigned and James's mother was no longer around to support him, the performance of James's father's company dropped. He stepped down and no one knows where he went after that. A year after marrying James, I noticed that his parent house was up for sale. We had a small wedding ceremony, given the complicated family issues, and only invited close family and relatives. Even so, it was a special day, and I was happy with how it turned out. Now, 
We have been blessed with a beautiful daughter, and I've quit my job to focus on raising her. My parents visit occasionally to help take care of her, which is a big help. James and I are committed to supporting each other and raising our daughter with love. I don't think marriage should be about money, but some people really care about wealth more than anything else. My sister-in-law, Laura, is one of those people. I never thought greed would become such a big issue over an inheritance after my brother, a well-respected surgeon, died. I'm Julia Roberts, I manage a jewelry store, and I'm happy being single at 35. However, I've been thinking about marriage since my boyfriend recently proposed. Our families are getting together tomorrow to celebrate our engagement, but I can feel tension brewing. My older brother Kyle, who is a well-known surgeon in Paris, has always looked out for me and taught me a lot because he's much older. He jokes about checking out my boyfriend as if he were my dad, which makes me laugh. But I can tell he's a bit worried. Kyle's marriage to Laura, a very beautiful woman with questionable morals, really shows the conflict between looks and true character. Despite their glamorous life, Laura's love for luxury puts a strain on our family relationships. Her need for expensive things often comes before her promises, leaving us let down and upset. At first, we overlooked Laura's behavior, thinking it was because of the pressure to look good. But as she started skipping more family events, our patients started to wear thin. Her decision to cancel on tomorrow's gathering at the last minute for tea at a fancy hotel is a perfect example of her selfishness. While we wouldn't mind her not being there, it's her lack of thought for others that really bothers me. I'm tired of always bending over backward to accommodate her every whim. I tried to talk to my brother about it, but his weakness for Laura stops any serious conversation. He just apologized for the inconvenience and tried to reassure me. He promised he would talk to her about her actions. I'll be there tomorrow, he assured me, convincing me to drop the issue for now. What bothers me the most isn't just Laura's selfishness, but also how she gets my busy brother to say sorry for her and do her tasks, even though she doesn't work and could handle them herself. Despite being at home full-time, Laura doesn't do housework, she hires cleaners and prefers to eat out. Her days are filled with shopping for brand-name items, leaving little time for real responsibilities. The next day, our family meeting went well, and my boyfriend won everyone over. It was a nice gathering, although it didn't last long. That evening, just as I was relaxing, Laura called out of the blue and started yelling. She demanded scones and macarons and scolded me for neglecting her. Confused, I tried to talk to her calmly, but she kept shouting. Despite my efforts to explain, Laura kept demanding, paying no attention to reason. She even demanded a souvenir from the hotel and had so many other unreasonable expectations that left me both puzzled and tired. What should have been a happy evening ended with me feeling exhausted and annoyed, because of Laura's unreasonable demands and outbursts. I wondered how Kyle managed to find peace in his daily life with Laura's constant mood swings. What made him marry her in the first place? While her beauty was obvious, her self-centered nature was off-putting. I thought maybe she was spoiled because of her looks. I was worried for Kyle, but I knew I shouldn't interfere with his marriage. It was his choice, after all, and he had always respected my choices too. The next day at the jewelry store where I work, I saw Laura outside, walking arm in arm with a man around her age, probably in his late thirties. They were chatting comfortably as they came into the store. I paused before going over to them. Laura acted like nothing was wrong when she saw me, which made me even more uncomfortable. When I asked about the man with her, Laura said he was just an old friend from her modeling days. Still, seeing them together, especially since she's married, made me feel uneasy. As Laura looked at the jewelry, she boldly asked if she could get an employee discount, seemingly unaware that this was inappropriate. I calmly told her we don't offer such discounts. Honestly, I didn't like the idea of her friend buying things for her and she seemed slightly annoyed when I told her the discount wasn't available. 
Laura picked out some items and left, leaving the man to pay the bill. This made me wonder about their relationship. That evening, I decided to talk to Kyle about what I saw. But when I called him, he seemed really down. Kyle, what's wrong? I asked, noticing he was upset. I had my suspicions about Laura, but I didn't mention them. When I tried to talk about my upcoming wedding, Kyle seemed distracted by his own thoughts. He talked about saving for our wedding next year and invited me over, but didn't say much about Laura. His uncertainty made me curious. Although I tried to discuss the wedding details, Kyle was noncommittal and ended the call abruptly, asking me to meet at our parents' house without explaining why. Maybe he wasn't feeling well. Kyle, a dedicated surgeon, often puts other people's needs before his own health, and this tendency of his to ignore his own health worries me, despite his jokes about the risks of his job. I couldn't stop thinking that his non-stop work schedule was wearing him down. I doubted that Laura, with her self-centered attitude, could give him the support he needed. Kyle sent an email later outlining the plan for a gathering at our parents' house. When I got there, I was shocked to see how pale and worn how he looked, worse than ever before. I asked him how he was, but he just gave me vague answers about being busy with work. Finally, I gathered the courage to talk about Laura's recent actions. I told him about her visit to my store with a young man and wondered aloud if she was deceiving him again. Laura's past actions had always worried me, and I couldn't overlook them any longer. I've been too busy with work to pay much attention to her, my brother confessed. Our parents were upset by her absence at the gathering, which gave me a chance to bring up my concerns. When I asked Kyle about Laura's absence, he said solemnly, Laura isn't here today, which is why I asked you all to come. I have a favor to ask. With a serious look, Kyle shared some shocking news. Despite our shock, he stood firm, leaving us stunned. Five months later, tragedy struck as my brother died from stomach cancer, a result of constant stress and overwork. It was a harsh truth to face. Despite his commitment to saving others, he had neglected his own health. He had started to see signs and went through tough tests that confirmed his illness. We wished he had told us sooner. Tears flowed at his funeral, surrounded by a deep feeling of loss. I remembered all the ways Kyle had supported me during my early challenges. His death before he even turned 20 left us overwhelmed with grief. Yet during our mourning, Laura's actions were glaringly obvious. She wore a flashy necklace to the funeral, a gift from another man, showing no respect for the solemn occasion. Her insensitive behavior was unbearable. Overcome with anger, I confronted her. Why are you wearing that? I asked, my voice shaking. Don't you realize how much my brother cared for you? Laura just smiled, seemingly untouched by the seriousness of the situation. I know, she replied carelessly, it's just how the world works. If you're so unhappy, why did you marry me? Her harsh words really hurt, and I had to hold back my anger in front of my brother, our parents, and the others. It was clear that Laura didn't care about my brother's memory at all. Her selfish behavior and her careless talk about their marriage and waiting for her inheritance made me furious. Before I knew it, I almost slapped her, but a man by her side caught my hand. He then introduced himself as a nurse who had worked with Kyle and was here to look after me at Kyle's request. I was confused in trying to understand everything going on. Despite the sadness of the funeral, hearing the laughter of the nurses and doctors, who were Kyle's colleagues, brought me a moment of comfort amidst the chaos. I turned to the nurse who had stopped me during the laughter for some clarity. His reply was straightforward. Did the doctor leave any inheritance behind? Your family should know. His words hit home, I knew very well that my brother hadn't left any inheritance. But Laura, not knowing this, became hysterical. She started accusing us of plotting against her to take the money for ourselves. She was sure she would soon get a large sum of money. As Laura's accusations grew louder, the nurse's amusement turned into full laughter. 
Seeing things getting out of hand, my dad stepped in, calm but assertive. Do you really not know? He asked her. Eager for answers, Laura demanded to know what was going on. I obliged, sharing the details of my brother's financial arrangements during his lifetime. He had set aside 20 million euro, specifically for my wedding, and had other generous gifts planned as well. As this reality dawned on Laura, her expression changed dramatically from shock to pale disbelief. My brother, although highly respected for his medical expertise, was known for his lavish spending habits. He indulged in extravagant parties, exclusive dinners, and luxurious accommodations as a way to relieve the stress from his demanding career and family responsibilities. Despite his intent to share these joys with Laura, she was notably absent during both his challenging and celebratory moments. It was not Laura who stood by him during tough times. Instead, it was his colleagues and friends, the very people who were now gathered to pay their respects, who supported him. The nurses, whose laughter had earlier filled the room, began to share poignant memories of my brother's acts of kindness and generosity. They recounted how, despite his hectic schedule, he always made time to look after them, hosting gatherings that left a lasting impression. Their stories deepened their admiration for him, inspiring them to strive harder in their own careers. As they spoke, they revealed another significant act of kindness from my brother, the donation of the remainder of his estate to the hospital. Representatives from the hospital were present and expressed their gratitude for his contribution, which would help alleviate their annual struggles with research funding and improve future medical care. Witnessing the extent of my brother's compassion towards others, I couldn't help but feel a pang of disappointment towards Laura. While he had impacted so many lives in such positive ways, Laura, who should have been his closest companion, displayed nothing but selfishness and greed. Months later, Laura contacted me, her tone as demanding as ever, eager to secure what she believed was her rightful inheritance. However, her careless management of the estate affairs revealed a shocking truth. Despite my brother's considerable earnings, his assets were nearly depleted. In her pursuit of the mansion and other properties, Laura had overlooked the fact that Kyle had accumulated significant debts. This oversight left her with only a fraction of what she had anticipated. Her pleas for help were met with no sympathy, as her earlier behavior had alienated those who might have otherwise been inclined to assist her. I made it clear to Laura that with Kyle's passing, the family ties that loosely bound us had effectively dissolved. Her behavior throughout had spoken louder than any words could, revealing her true motives despite her claims of affection for my brother. I could potentially help you out of this trouble, I told her, but how can you expect that after you've been so blatantly selfish? My voice was tinged with disbelief and disappointment as I spoke. Laura's response was fraught with impatience, a stark contrast to the composed facade she usually maintained. She was grappling with the new and harsh reality of inheriting not only the mansion, but also the substantial debts that came with it. I reminded her, somewhat coldly, that inheriting meant taking responsibility for both assets and liabilities. I even pointed out that she had the option to renounce the inheritance within five months of being informed. The suggestion that she might sell the luxury items she had amassed over the years to cover the debts only elicited a flood of tears and desperate pleas for forgiveness. Despite her remorse, or perhaps because of the insincerity I felt underlined it, I found myself unable to offer any consolation. The conversation ended with a heavy heart on my part, as I was unable to reconcile her past actions with the cherished memory of my brother. Following Kyle's death, the plans for my wedding had to be postponed by a year. During this challenging period, the cloud of depression lingered over me, a stark reminder of the loss and betrayal I had experienced. Recognizing my distress, my husband and his family extended their heartfelt understanding and support. Their compassion was a beacon of light during a time darkened by loss and disappointment. Determined not to let the memory of my late brother down, 
I vow to live a life of gratitude, channeling my energies into supporting and acknowledging those who had stood by me through thick and thin. When the wedding finally took place, it was not just a celebration of union, but also a tribute to Kyle's lasting impact on those around him. His popularity and the respect he commanded among his colleagues became poignantly evident as many of them visited his grave to pay their respects. They shared stories of his generosity and kindness, especially towards his co-workers, further cementing his legacy as a man who had genuinely cared for others beyond the confines of family and personal gain. Through these reflections and tributes, the wedding became a dual ceremony of love and remembrance, intertwining my new beginning with the honoring of a life that, while tragically cut short, had profoundly touched many. This convergence of joy and sorrow underscored the complexities of life and the enduring influence of genuine connections forged in both joyous and challenging times. I was always concerned that my brother's generosity might make him vulnerable to those looking to exploit his kind nature. However, the overwhelming support from friends and colleagues after his passing reassured me that his goodwill had been genuinely appreciated, not taken advantage of. Meanwhile, news about Laura's decline began to circulate within the jewelry industry and among our social circles. Known for her lavish lifestyle and a series of questionable relationships, she painted a stark contrast to my brother's legacy of generosity and integrity. Laura, who had once lived in luxury, was now forced to sell her opulent mansion due to her unsustainable spending habits and the mountain of debt she had accumulated over the years. Now, she found herself living in modest accommodations, a far cry from the grandeur she was accustomed to. Her financial downfall was a topic of quiet discussion and served as a cautionary tale about the perils of living beyond one's means. Reflecting on Laura's misfortunes, I couldn't help but feel vindicated in my long-held belief that marrying for money was a fundamentally flawed motivation. It was clear that Laura's priorities had led her to a lonely and challenging path, whereas my brother's focus on kindness and giving had earned him lasting respect and love from those around him. Motivated by these reflections, I vowed more fervently to honor my brother's memory by protecting his legacy. He had spent his life not only as a skilled surgeon but as a pillar of support and generosity in our community. In his professional life, he was revered not just for his medical expertise, but for his willingness to go beyond the call of duty to assist his colleagues and patients alike. At home, he had always been my protector, guiding, and supporting me through life's challenges. Determined to keep his spirit alive, I engaged more actively in community service and charity work, areas my brother was passionate about. I organized fundraisers and volunteered at the hospital where he had worked, helping to fund the programs he had started or supported. These efforts brought me a sense of closeness to him, a feeling that I was continuing his work in some way. Moreover, I took steps to ensure that the stories of his kindness and generosity were remembered and celebrated. I shared these stories at community gatherings and on social media, ensuring that his legacy would inspire others as much as it inspired me. The positive responses from people who had been touched by my brother's life encouraged me to keep sharing and celebrating his life. In doing so, I found a profound sense of purpose. While Laura's life seemed to spiral into chaos as a result of her choices, I found strength and fulfillment in upholding the values my brother had taught me. This contrast between our paths was a stark reminder of the different outcomes that result from our life choices. By choosing to embody my brother's principles of generosity and support, I not only honored his memory but also enriched my own life, making it fuller and more meaningful. Through these actions, I not only kept my brother's memory alive, but also ensured that his legacy of kindness and selflessness continued to impact the community, proving that the values he lived by were his true lasting wealth. My name is Mary, and I'm in my early 51s. I've been married to James for 21 years, and our life is mostly peaceful and happy. Even though we don't have children, we're content. 
James is three years older than me, and he works at a regular company. He hasn't really changed much over the years, but because I only work part-time, we have a little extra money to spend on nice things. Our marriage has been steady, without any big problems. But then, something small happened that shook up our calm life. It all started when I learned that my father had passed away and I inherited his apartment. After James and I got married, my father moved into a new, modern three-bedroom apartment. Meanwhile, James and I lived in my childhood home, a five-bedroom house full of memories. My father had given it to us as a wedding gift, and he was happy for us to start our life there. I was so touched by his gesture. When my father passed away, I inherited his apartment. I loved that place, so I decided to rent it out right away. But one day, during conversation with James's family, an unexpected suggestion came up. Someone said, Rachel and her kids are living in a small place. How about they move into Mary's five-bedroom house? Rachel is James's younger sister. She's divorced and raising two kids in a three-bedroom apartment, which is probably a bit cramped for them. To be honest, my relationship with Rachel hasn't been great. Every time we meet, she makes little sarcastic comments about the fact that James and I don't have kids yet. James and I got married just before we turned 32, and ever since then, Rachel has been making these remarks. As I got older, her comments became even more cutting, like, you're over 32 and still no kids? Or don't people see you as less of a woman without children? What hurt me the most was something she said after my father passed away. She looked at me and said, it's a shame your father never got to see a grandchild. That really shocked me and left me feeling numb. Rachel is actually five years older than me, so instead of a younger sister-in-law, she feels more like an older one. We've always tried to be kind to her and treat her like family, but those remarks really stung. I naturally built a wall in my heart against Rachel. I'm an only child, and my father was my only family. Losing him was hard enough, but Rachel's words made it even worse. Some time had passed since my father's death, and I hadn't seen Rachel for a while. Then, out of nowhere, my mother-in-law brought up something unexpected. She said, Rachel is willing to pay $1,000 a month in rent. When I saw the smug look on her face, I was too shocked to say anything. The apartment we lived in was old, but we took good care of it, and it was still in good shape. There was a big mall nearby, and transportation was easy with buses and trains. If we rented out the apartment, I thought it would go for at least $2,500 a month. But $1,000? That was unbelievable. Didn't they know the going rate for this area? Renting out such a spacious five-bedroom apartment for only $1,000 a month was ridiculous. Maybe they thought I had agreed, because I didn't say anything right away. My mother-in-law seemed really excited about the idea and said, you already have another apartment, right? You can live there instead. Even if you don't renew the lease, Rachel and her kids can move in, so it's all fine. How long is the contract? James seemed excited too and added, that's a great idea. The place your father lived is new and perfect for just the two of us. At this point, the conversation was moving forward without even considering our thoughts and I started to panic. I couldn't help but blurt out, isn't there an option for all of us to live together in this apartment? James's parents had a big house, and they were the only ones living there. They even had rooms for both James and Rachel, so I thought it would be fine if they all moved in. After all, they said they wanted a bigger place. Normally, before making decisions like this, you talk with the family. But moving in with James's parents would mean Rachel's kids would have to change schools, and they seemed worried about the cost and hassle of getting new school uniforms and gym clothes. I didn't want to directly say I didn't want to rent the apartment to Rachel in front of my mother-in-law, but I said, this is my hometown. I can't just leave so easily. I left their house, but my mother-in-law said, you don't have to decide right away, which made me feel like she wasn't giving up. When I got home, I asked James, this apartment is special to us. Why are you so quick to decide to leave? He seemed surprised and said, well, it's not a single family home. I was shocked by his answer. Maybe because he grew up in a house, an apartment didn't feel like a real home to him. But I wished he could at least understand my feelings and apologize. Instead, I felt upset. 
I raised my voice and said, This is my home, my apartment. Why are you making decisions without asking me? James looked upset and replied, We've been married for 21 years. Why are you saying my apartment? It's our apartment. I could hear the frustration in his voice. I wished he could understand how much this apartment meant to me as my special home. If he had hesitated about renting it to his sister, I might not have felt so hurt by his words. But in that moment, I felt deeply hurt. We tried to calmly talk about it many times after that, but it was difficult. James didn't seem to understand my feelings at all. He started calling me things like money-minded, stubborn, and selfish. As time went on, the distance between us stayed the same. During this period, I kept getting messages from my mother-in-law asking if we had made any progress on moving. The pressure from both my mother-in-law and James, who didn't seem to understand my perspective, wore me down. I felt like I was nearing my breaking point. Then one day, I was shocked to receive an email from Rachel. She wrote, Why are you two, without kids, holding on to such a big space? You don't need it. Just move out. I hadn't heard from Rachel since we started talking about the apartment, and now here she was, telling me to leave. I never imagined she would send such a blunt message. Reading her email, I reflected on everything I had been through and felt a wave of self-doubt. The idea of divorce crossed my mind several times. Each time, I tried to calm myself, but I was reaching my limit. I decided to visit the local government office to start the process for a divorce. I also reached out to a specific place to understand the next steps. A few days later, with a clearer mindset, I went to the court. After checking, I found out that both the apartment we lived in and the one I was renting out were in my name. It was legally mine. Confirming this gave me the strength to confront my situation with James. I thought about what I needed to do next and decided we needed to talk seriously. I told James, I've said this many times this is my house. I can't stand the idea of renting it to Rachel. I don't want to give my home to someone who treats me poorly. Please talk to your mother and Rachel about this. James's face darkened like he was tired of the conversation. I had already told him about all the hurtful things Rachel had said to me and how much I disliked her behavior. I wanted him to understand my feelings, but instead, he sided with Rachel, saying, Rachel is right. It was then that I realized how things had truly changed. I could have gone through with a divorce at that moment, ending the pain I was feeling, but I couldn't bring myself to end a 21-year relationship so quickly. Deep down, I was ready for divorce if James rejected what I had to say. Still, I thought to myself, maybe I'm being too sensitive about Rachel. Maybe she isn't being as condescending as I think, and I'm just exaggerating things. James didn't get it, though. He said, I really don't understand why you feel this way. His words hurt. Was I the only one feeling like this? I asked him, If that's how you feel, will you sign this? And I handed him the divorce papers. James looked shocked but quickly replied, Do you really want to end our relationship over something so small? He didn't understand that it wasn't a small issue to me. I'm serious, I said, looking him in the eyes. I care about Rachel too, but lately, things between us have changed. I don't feel the same love anymore, so I'm leaving. My heart ached when I saw how casual James was about it, smiling like it wasn't a big deal. It made me feel like he didn't understand how deeply this was affecting me, and I felt tears start to well up. I just wanted him to leave sooner rather than later. James then said in a softer tone, Maybe Rachel and my mother don't really want to get along with you. Have you ever thought that because you always focus on yourself, our relationship has suffered? His words stung again. We had always misunderstood each other, even while trying to make things work. I think it's impossible to fix our relationship now, no matter how much we talk. I can't imagine a future with you anymore, I said calmly. If you can't understand my feelings, then we'll have to go through with the divorce. James looked both surprised and sad as he asked, Do you really feel that way? Then he left the house without saying anything else. He didn't sign the divorce papers, and he left all his belongings behind. A few days later, James came back. He looked sad and unsure. What should we do from here? He asked quietly. I could tell he thought I might forgive him if he acted humble, but my mind was already made up. 
There was nothing left to discuss. If you agree to the divorce, sign the papers, I said. If not, we'll have to take legal action. And by the way, I've decided to let go of this house. I had been thinking about selling it for a while. The day I went to get the divorce papers, I talked to Mr. Eric, an old friend of my father's. I'd known him for years. When I was a child, Mr. Eric was always by my father's side until the very end. He even attended my father's funeral and gave me his business card, telling me to reach out if I ever needed help. The card had the details of his law firm. Thanks to Mr. Eric, I was able to get help from a legal advisor to deal with my father's inheritance. When I told Mr. Eric about my situation, he gave me honest and helpful advice. He explained the importance of checking property ownership, dealing with divorce complications, and other tips that helped protect me. After James left the house for a while, I decided to sell the apartment. I quickly contacted real estate agents to start the process. I also informed Mr. Eric about my rocky relationship with James and how he refused to sign the divorce papers. Asked for his help in handling the divorce. When James found out I was selling the apartment, he was shocked and angry. You always said this was our family home. Are you really going to sell such an important place? After all the concern you had about Rachel, you're being selfish, he said. But his words didn't affect me anymore. I looked him straight in the eyes and asked, Do you have anything else to say? James seemed surprised but quickly began arguing. Why would you make such a big decision on your own? The apartment may be in your name, but after a divorce, there should be a division of property. This place belongs to both of us, right? James was clearly emotional and desperate, but I calmly smiled and responded, Actually, this apartment has been in my name since before we got married. I checked with my lawyer, and anything owned before marriage isn't part of the property division. Selling the apartment was difficult, but I didn't want to hold on to painful memories in this home. With the advice from Mr. Eric about property laws, I decided selling was the best choice. When James realized the truth, his attitude changed quickly. I'm sorry, he said. This place means a lot to you, but it hasn't been sold yet, right? Please reconsider. Let's give it another try. I'll talk to Rachel and mom. Just stop the divorce and the sale of the apartment. As I listened to him plead, I found myself wondering why I had stayed with him for 21 long years. I was shocked that I had chosen someone like him. Don't try to act nice now. When we were together, you never stood by my side. The idea of starting over with you is impossible, so please leave. We both need to move on. He wasn't easily convinced, and this created a big gap between us. But after going through all the necessary steps, I was finally able to end our relationship. It felt like the start of a new chapter in my life. At first, being alone seemed scary, but I realized it wasn't as bad as I thought. Now I live in a new three-bedroom apartment, living life the way I want. My mother is with me, and even though he's gone, I'm fine. Everything is okay. My husband once coldly said, you're not needed here. That shocked me. I had been sending $3,100 every month to his parents, but it didn't matter to him. Then, to make things worse, my mother-in-law added, a wife who can't do proper housework isn't needed, with a cold smile, almost as if she was happy to see me go. Realizing there was no point in trying to please these people anymore, I decided to leave. With a calm smile, I replied, if that's what you think, then I'll go. My husband looked shocked. My name is Lauren, and I'm a 35-year-old office worker. I met my husband Michael through a blind date set up by a friend. He was friendly and outgoing, and we hit it off quickly. We got married, and now we've been together for three years. We don't have any children yet. Before we got married, Michael lived with his mother. When we got married, he suggested building a new house on his family's property. He said, I'm worried about my mom living alone. I want to be with her, but I also want us to have our own life together. I think this is the best idea. I asked, but won't we have to get a mortgage for the house? Michael reassured me, the house will be paid for with the inheritance my father left me. We won't need a mortgage and the land is free. The house will be in my name and we can just support my mom with monthly payments. What do you think? Does that sound okay? I wondered, aren't you worried about your mom's finances? Michael replied, we'll be helping her and she has income from her part-time job and her pension, 
So everything will be fine. It seemed like a good plan and Michael even said, when you work late, my mom can help with the housework. It will make things easier for you. We would live in separate houses, but on the same property. I was excited about starting our new life together and building our dream home. Having help with housework during busy times seemed perfect. But later, I realized how naive I had been. In the beginning, our marriage was wonderful. We were both busy with work, but the house was easy to maintain, and everything seemed fine. My mother-in-law had her part-time job and didn't visit us too often. We shared the living expenses, and things felt balanced. One day, though, Michael brought up a new idea. He said, I'll take care of all the household expenses, so can you transfer the regular payment to mom every month? I want you to handle that. I was surprised and asked, how much will it be? He said, maybe about $2,200 a month. But when I did the math, I realized $2,200 was less than what we had been sending. So, without telling Michael, I decided to continue sending $2,800 a month to his mom. That amount took a big chunk out of my paycheck, but with other expenses like utilities, groceries, and medical bills, Michael was still covering most of the costs. His salary went into our joint account, and from there, I made the payments and added the rest to our savings. This arrangement worked for about a year. However, when my mother-in-law quit her part-time job and started visiting more often, things began to change. One day, she said, I'm getting older, so I decided to quit my job and take it easy. Michael responded, That's okay, Mom. You don't need to worry anymore. We're here for you. Thank you, Michael. You've always been so kind, she said. At first, it was nice to see them getting along. But then she started to criticize the way I kept the house. It looks like you haven't been cleaning properly. There's dust everywhere. This is unacceptable. I apologized. I'm really sorry. I've been busy with work and haven't been able to keep up with everything. That's just an excuse, she said. You're living in Michael's house, so the least you can do is take care of the basic chores. And I've heard you take shortcuts with cooking, too. Is that true? I sometimes make simple meals when I come home late from work, but I still do my best, I explained. Then she said something that really hurt. Maybe it was a mistake choosing you as Michael's wife. After all these years, the fact that you still don't have children is also a problem. Her words stung, and I realized that things had taken a serious turn for the worse. I felt like not having children wasn't entirely my fault, but arguing about it would only cause more problems. Originally, my mother-in-law had promised to help with household chores when things got tough, especially since we were living on the same property. However, it seemed both Michael and my mother-in-law had forgotten that promise. Now, whenever she was around, she constantly criticized me, so I decided to just ignore her comments. Amid all this, a bigger issue arose. Our joint account balance was getting low because Michael's salary hadn't been deposited for five months. I confronted him, asking, why hasn't your salary been deposited? What he said next shocked me he had quit his job and was looking for a new one. I thought he had been going to work every day, but he had actually been job hunting. Why did you quit without telling me? This is serious, I said. I'm sorry, I feel bad about it, Michael replied. My boss was always on my case, nagging me for every little mistake. Everyone makes mistakes, right? But he acted like I was the only one. Michael explained that a mistake he made caused the company a big loss, and while most bosses would give a warning, his didn't. I understood that his work environment was tough, but since he had already quit, we needed to figure out what to do next. Have you found any new job prospects? I asked. The problem is, I can't find a job that matches my skills, he said. At this point, shouldn't you just take a job, even if it's not ideal? We can't afford to be too picky right now, I suggested. But Michael insisted, No, I want to choose carefully for my next job, where I plan to stay until retirement. What about our finances? I asked. Well, you're working too, so you can help support us for a while, right? He replied, as if it were no big deal. I realized he wasn't going to change his mind, so I decided to endure until he found another job. But with our income so low, after sending money to my in-laws, there was barely anything left. We had to dip into our savings, which were almost gone. To make up for this, 
I decided to work more hours to increase my income. Luckily, my workplace valued me and they agreed to let me work overtime. However, when I returned home late, my mother-in-law would often be waiting for me, ready to criticize. I couldn't help but wonder, how did it come to this? I can't believe a daughter-in-law doesn't do any housework, my mother-in-law said angrily. I'm sorry, it's because of work, I tried to explain. Making excuses, going out to play, and then asking Michael for more money? I need money for living expenses and the remittances. My salary alone isn't enough, I said. Hearing this, my mother-in-law got even angrier, complaining about just $2,800? You live in Michael's house for free and don't even do any chores. Unbelievable. It was shocking to me that she thought $2,800 was nothing. I worked hard to earn that money. It seemed like she took the monthly payments for granted and didn't appreciate their value. She added, because you don't do the housework, I have to or Michael suffers. It's hard dealing with such an incompetent daughter-in-law. Even though she acted like she did all the work, my mother-in-law often bought ready-made meals from the store and only did laundry for herself and Michael. The kitchen was always left messy, with dirty dishes everywhere. Michael and my mother-in-law always had their meals prepared, but not for me. I was usually told to eat whatever was left over. Michael would just relax in front of the TV while I dealt with my mother-in-law's harsh words. Over time, my feelings for my husband started to fade. His job search wasn't going well, and he was too proud to apply to anything less than top companies. A year had passed, and he still hadn't found a job. He just spent his days doing nothing. Hey, if this keeps up, we're going to run out of savings. Can't you get a part-time job to help with the bills? I asked him. Michael glared at me and said sharply, Why should I get a part-time job? This house isn't even in your name, it's mine. You're just living here and can't even take care of me properly, so of course you have to pay the bills. I felt the future was looking bleak. I was paying for everything our living expenses and the remittances to his mother, but there was a limit to how much I could earn. Remittances? It's just $2,800. Stop nagging me. If you don't like it, leave my house, he said angrily, hitting the table before walking out of the room. Michael dismissed the amount I worked hard to earn, calling it just $2,800. Our relationship had never been more strained. Then, unexpectedly, some good news came. Michael had a chance to get a job at a company run by his mother's friend. While the salary wasn't as high as his old job, I was just thankful he would be working again. The trial period was set for five months. Michael grumbled, I don't think this company is the right fit for my skills, but it's hard to say no since my mom introduced me. As long as you're willing to work, that's what matters. Do your best and aim for full employment, I replied. I never imagined that Michael's new job would cause more problems. At first, he left for work every morning with energy, but after a month, things changed. He started coming home late, and sometimes he didn't come home at all. His jacket smelled like a woman's perfume that I didn't recognize. On top of that, he stopped contributing his salary to our household and even started withdrawing money from our joint account without asking me, while still sending the monthly remittance to his mother. I decided to stop putting my salary into the joint account, which made Michael furious. He confronted me, asking, why aren't you putting money in the account? The balance is almost zero. Where is your salary going? You're not paying for the living expenses. Tell me how you're using the money. I told him, that's not fair. Am I the only one earning and managing our household? If you contribute, I will too. Michael shot back. This house is mine. It's only natural for you to contribute. I was shocked by how he expected me to use my earnings for his spending, pay the remittances to his mother, and cover all the household costs. I also started to suspect he was having an affair, though I didn't have proof yet. I decided to investigate. Since I couldn't afford to hire a private investigator, I had to do it myself. One night, while Michael was asleep, I used his fingerprint to unlock his phone. I found messages with a woman named Julie, and the content was shocking. The messages said things like, I really enjoyed our date today. I wish we could be together forever. And would you consider marrying me? I'll get rid of my wife. Wait for me can't wait to start our life in a new home. I took screenshots and saved the messages to my phone. 
I then decided to find out who Julie was. But before I could act on it, I came home from work one day to find bags piled up at the entrance. What's all this? I asked. Michael replied coldly, I've decided to live with my mom instead of you, since you don't do the housework. You made this decision without talking to me? This is my house too. You can't just make decisions like this. I said. He responded, You have no right to complain. Since I'm paying for the remittances and living expenses, I can decide what happens here. It's better with my mom around, so you should leave. To make matters worse, my mother-in-law also chimed in, saying, A wife who doesn't do housework is useless, smiling like she was happy to see me go. At that moment, I realized it was pointless to keep trying with these people. I made my decision in that moment. First, please sign this, I said, pulling out the divorce papers I had prepared for my bag and handing them to Michael. Confused, he asked, when did you prepare this? The day you told me to leave the house. I got them right after you said that, I replied calmly. Michael was surprised, but eventually he agreed and signed the papers. I signed them as well and said, I'll submit these to the city office. I'll arrange for a moving company to get my things out as soon as I find a new place. I want you out as soon as possible. My mother-in-law yelled at me, but I ignored her. I packed the essentials into a bag and headed to my parents' house. They were surprised by my sudden arrival, but they welcomed me with open arms, understanding that something was wrong. The next day, I took some time off from work and began to take action. First, I submitted the divorce papers to the city office. Then, I started looking for a lawyer to help with the divorce process and any compensation I could claim. I also began searching for a new place to live. It was a busy time, but I felt a sense of fulfillment as I moved forward with my life. I found a nice, modern apartment perfect for a single person and hired a moving company to help with the move. On the day of the move, I returned to the house while Michael was at work, but his mother was there. The movers took my furniture, appliances, and other belongings, piece by piece. You're taking everything? The house will be so empty, she said. These are all the things I bought when we got married. I used my savings to get the furniture and appliances. Since the house is in Michael's name, these items are mine, I explained. She couldn't argue and was clearly frustrated. After moving into my new, luxury apartment, I started enjoying my independence. I was able to use all my income for myself, and thanks to my hard work and overtime, I got promoted and my salary increased. Life went on like this for about five months. Then I started getting a lot of calls from my mother-in-law. I regretted not blocking her, but eventually, I gave in and answered one of her many calls. Hello, Lauren, can we talk? She said. What do you want? I asked, tired of her persistence. Please, can you come back? She pleaded. What? I thought you wanted me to leave. I'm sorry. I've thought about it and reflected on everything, she replied. She wanted me to start sending her $2,800 again, just like before. I couldn't believe how selfish she was. She explained that Michael's affair at work had been exposed, and he couldn't get a regular job anymore, only part-time work. He and Julie had started living together, but Julie didn't like living with his mother, so she moved back to her old home. Without the money I used to send, she was struggling to survive on her pension. I have nothing to do with you anymore. I won't send you any money, I said firmly. Then I blocked her number and also blocked Michael's. I didn't want any more contact with either of them. But a few days later, Michael showed up outside my workplace. Lauren, I'm sorry. Can we start over? I'm in trouble, he said, clearly desperate. I was shocked to see him there. He explained that living with Julie hadn't worked out because she couldn't do housework, and after the affair became public, he felt uncomfortable at work and quit. Their relationship fell apart because of their financial struggles and constant arguments, and Julie had left him. It's too late, I told him. I don't want to see you again. If you try to ambush me like this again, I'll call the police. He shouted, wait, as I walked away, but I ignored him and went home. Later, with the help of my lawyer, I received $50,000 in compensation, and Julie paid me an additional $210,000. I heard that Michael was now working several part-time jobs to pay off his debts and had even resorted to shady ways of getting money. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law had gone back to working part-time and was living frugally. 
They were constantly blaming each other for their problems. Julie had started working night shifts to pay off her debts after quitting her job and breaking up with Michael. As for me, I've adopted a little dog and am enjoying peaceful, happy days in my new apartment, looking forward to whatever life has in store next. I'm sorry, but we have already left. While I was in the bathroom at the rest stop, I got a call from Larry. I was curious about what he wanted at such a time. When I answered the call, I heard Larry and his in-laws laughing loudly. What's going on? I asked. He told me something shocking. We're going to have fun with the family. You can go back home and clean or something. I had been really looking forward to this trip because it had been a long time since our last one. Even though I had doubts about traveling with his family, I was excited to stay at a fancy inn. I can't believe he left me alone at a rest stop. Standing inside the bathroom stall, I felt deeply betrayed and shook with anger. Still, I managed to say okay quietly. It's unforgivable. Today was not only our wedding anniversary but also my birthday, and we came on this trip for that. I'll make him regret this. My name is Linda Harrison. I'm a 36-year-old housewife. I don't have any children and live with my husband, Larry. We got married exactly one year ago on my birthday. Larry is romantic and has always made a big deal of our anniversaries and birthdays. Growing up, he was treated to fancy dinners, trips abroad, and cruises for his birthdays. It seems those childhood memories have stayed with him because he loves celebrating special days in a big way. Now that we're married, Larry's family is wealthy. His father is the CEO of Harrison Securities. My mother-in-law has fully embraced the wealthy lifestyle, and Larry, as the heir to the company, sometimes acts a bit spoiled. But I married him because I knew he cherished me. We met at a matchmaking agency where men from wealthy families like Larry were popular. I almost gave up on finding someone there. When I met him, I was lucky because I seemed to be his type, which led to our marriage. It might have helped that I wasn't just looking for someone rich. I had always dreamed of getting married, and I was thrilled when it happened. But I didn't know that after getting married, my life would start to get tough. A year ago, Larry and I started our married life in a one-bedroom apartment in the city. Larry wanted a bigger house, but I didn't think it was necessary since it was just the two of us. I suggested we live within our means for now, and we could always move later. Even though we were in the city, our rent was expensive at $2,300. As a housewife, this made me feel guilty. Don't worry about it, my dad will handle it, Larry said. Although he was the heir and worked at Harrison Securities, I thought there should be some fairness with other employees. I wondered if it was really okay. But the next month, his salary went up by $800. Your dad's amazing to be able to increase your salary just like that, I said. It was time for a raise anyway. I won't let you face any hardships, Linda. Count on me, Larry replied. Even though Larry relied on his father's influence for money, I felt thankful for the raise and didn't argue. By the way, I'm having dinner with my parents tonight, he added suddenly. Is it like a business dinner? No, just a family dinner. I think I'll be back by 12. Take care. I was surprised. Even after marrying me, Larry casually mentioned having dinner with his parents on a regular evening. Caught off guard, I watched him say he should get going and then leave the house. Dinner on a weekday. Well, today is Friday after all. I hadn't heard about Larry planning to have dinner with his in-laws. Usually, as his wife, I'd be invited too. Not that I wanted a free meal. But it's important to build a good relationship with one's in-laws. I couldn't understand Larry's actions and started feeling unsure about our married life. After that dinner incident, Larry often went to his parents' house for reasons like, it's my cousin's birthday, or mom asked me to come over. As a first-time bride, I just agreed, thinking this was normal. But when I had dinner with a friend one day and Larry was absent, she was surprised. He goes home that often and leaves you alone for a cousin's birthday. That's crazy, she said. She had been married for six years and knew more about married life than I did. 
Realizing that her reaction was normal, I felt embarrassed. You're right, it's weird, but Larry says it's normal. Seriously, don't take this the wrong way, but hasn't he really grown up yet? She commented. Her words made me think. It's unusual for a 38-year-old, even one set to take over his dad's business, to prioritize family matters so much after getting married. I regretted not seeing Larry's true nature before marrying him. Returning home after dinner with my friend, I felt sad. I'm home, Linda. Where have you been? Isn't it normal for a wife to cook dinner and wait for her husband, Mrs. Harrison? To my surprise, my mother-in-law was in the living room. Larry was out, maybe at a convenience store. Why are you here? Weren't you and Larry supposed to dine out tonight? I asked. That got cancelled because of some issue at the restaurant. I thought Larry had messaged you just a bit ago. Didn't you check? She pointed out. I checked my phone and indeed, 22 minutes ago, Larry had messaged that he'd be home early, but I had just gotten off the train. There was no way I could have gotten home and started dinner so quickly. Yes, he did message, but I only saw it just now. What the heck? This is the problem with kids from single-parent households. You can tell they weren't raised right, my mother-in-law said harshly. Her words hurt me deeply. Indeed, I was raised by a single mother after my mom gave birth to me and my father passed away due to an illness. Despite that, my mother raised me with a lot of love. I wished she wouldn't say things that put down my mother's hard work. It has nothing to do with being raised by a single parent. I just hadn't seen the message yet. I replied, clearly annoyed, but she ignored my comment and changed the subject. Well, anyway, I've always thought this, but your house is quite small. I think it's average, it's just right for the two of us. You can't be serious. I feel sorry for Larry living in such a cramped space. My interactions with my mother-in-law continued to stress me out. Both my mother-in-law and father-in-law, maybe because they are wealthy, often seem to look down on others. That's why I never got along with them. Realizing that further conversation was pointless, I silently started to make dinner. Ignoring me, she turned on the TV. From that day, she started coming over unexpectedly more often, and even my father-in-law came a few times. Mostly, they complained about how dirty the kitchen was or how small the house felt. Eventually, they would sarcastically suggest, you know we have a bigger house. Why not move in? I definitely didn't want that and declined every time. They always visited when Larry wasn't home, so he didn't hear their rude remarks. I once talked to him about it, but he replied, Why not? Why is living together a bad idea? I was upset by his response. From then on, I realized there was no point in discussing it with Larry, and I just put up with it on my own. Soon we would be celebrating our first wedding anniversary, which was also my birthday. For your birthday this weekend, I'm thinking of celebrating bigger than last year. After all, it's also our anniversary, Larry said, coming home tipsy from work. Seeing his flushed face, I wasn't sure he meant it. Knowing he liked big celebrations, I felt a bit excited. Last year, you treated me to a delicious dinner, which was more than enough. That's nothing compared to what I've planned. Let's go on a family trip. A family trip? The term sounded odd just for the two of us. Noticing my confusion, Larry continued, my parents, cousins, uncle scenes, and all will join. We're heading to a luxury resort in Oceanside. All those people, and why Oceanside? Do you have a problem with a family trip, or is it Oceanside you're not keen on? No, it's not that, honestly. I couldn't understand why my birthday and our anniversary had to involve Larry's family, who weren't part of these occasions. I knew Larry was a bit out of touch, but I didn't expect such a strange idea. Although the choice of Oceanside confused me a little, it wasn't a big deal. Sounds fun, right, Linda? Sometimes you've got to let loose and have fun, Larry said, a bit drunk, as he grabbed my shoulders. I found myself agreeing with him. Over the next week, I couldn't stop thinking about the trip. At first, I was unsure about going with his whole family, 
But as Larry said, it was a rare vacation, and I decided to make the most of it. As I prepared for the trip, I started to feel excited, and I found myself genuinely smiling. I knew my in-laws would probably make their usual rude remarks, but I decided to ignore them completely. Finally, the awaited Saturday came, and Larry and I went to his parents' house, our meeting point for the trip. Well, Linda, you're late, aren't you? Do you even realize you're the star today? My mother-in-law said sharply in front of everyone. But knowing I was supposed to be the focus helped soften her words a little. I'm sorry there was traffic, I replied. Excuses won't do. We should leave soon. Otherwise, we'll be late to our luxury resort. All right, all right, let's get going, I said. Despite their complaints about us being late, it was bearable. After all, they had been making such comments all year. Larry's cousin, who looked much younger than him and had a mean look in his eyes, made me wonder if everyone in the family was mean-spirited. My worry seemed justified when he made a demeaning remark, this is Larry's wife, not what I expected. I looked away from him, figuring that reacting would only encourage them to criticize me more. I decided to act maturely. I'm so excited. I've been to luxury resorts many times, but tonight's place costs $2,000 per person, I heard someone say. Hearing the price of $22,000 shocked me, and a sudden thought crossed my mind. I got into my in-law's car, and as soon as my father-in-law started the car, we began moving. The drive to our destination in Oceanside would take about three hours. About an hour into our journey, we decided to take a short break at the next rest stop. I'll be right back, heading to the restroom, I said. All right, off you go. My mother-in-law waved dismissively, almost like shooing away a stray dog. I walked to the rest stop bathroom, feeling as if everyone's eyes were on me, or maybe it was just my imagination. Inside the bathroom stall, I took a deep breath, relieved that the trip had been uneventful so far. I hoped the rest of our journey would be just as smooth. Just as I was settling into that thought, my phone vibrated in my pocket. It was Larry calling. Expecting him to ask me to pick something up, I answered casually, I'm still in the restroom, Larry. With what sounded like amusement, he replied, accompanied by the laughter of my mother-in-law, sorry, but we've already left. There was a moment of stunned silence on my end while laughter echoed from their side. What do you mean? I asked. Larry replied, we're going to have fun with our family. You should just go home and clean, Linda dear. Today's trip is just for the Harrison family. It's a pity, but you'll have to stay behind. Goodbye. I was stunned. I had been looking forward to this trip for a long time. Having his family join us was a bit concerning, but I was excited about staying at a luxury hotel. And now, they had left me alone at the rest area. I was shaking inside the restroom stall, feeling completely betrayed. Trying to keep my anger in check, I simply replied with a quiet okay. This was unforgivable. Today was both our wedding anniversary and my birthday, and they had brought me on this trip. I was determined to make them regret this. After leaving the restroom, I called someone. The person on the other end was shocked and shared some surprising news. Really? I asked. Yes, they answered. Then they promised to come and pick me up. Being left alone at the rest area, like this was unbearable, I prayed for a quick rescue. An hour later, my uncle scene arrived in his car to pick me up. I'm so sorry to trouble you like this, I said. It's okay, it's quite an unfortunate situation, he replied. Yes, they're headed to a luxury hotel in Oceanside, I mentioned. My uncle scene thought for a moment, then seemed to realize something. I think that's the case, I replied. I'm really sorry, but can you please take me there? I'll take the train back. Got it. The drive there is nice anyway. My uncle scene agreed happily. About an hour later, we arrived in Oceanside. Larry and the others had come here before us. In front of us was a luxurious inn with a grand gate, a well-known high-end hotel, the only luxury accommodation I knew of that costs $2,000 a night. At the reception, I was told, 
Dinner starts at 6 o'clock p.m. Please follow me. The person who greeted me with a smile was my mother. Linda, it's been a while, she said. Dressed in an elegant outfit and smiling gracefully in a way that might seem formal to others, it was unmistakably my mother. This inn has been run by my mother's family for many years, and she currently holds the position of the innkeeper. After becoming a single mother, she began working at this inn. So to me, this place feels like home. I had called my mother from the rest area and was surprised to learn that there was a reservation today from Harrison Securities. I suspected they were going to a luxury hotel in Oceanside, but I never imagined they would be coming to the inn my mother runs. Of course, the family doesn't know that my mother manages this inn. What a terrible story, Linda. You can't just let this slide, my mom said. Yeah, I know. That's why I came here, I replied. Let's get you changed over here, she suggested, as I prepared to greet them at the dinner table. An hour later, at 7 o'clock p.m., my in-law family gathered for dinner. I stayed in the next room to remain unnoticed, slightly opening the door to observe inside. The spa was amazing. I'd want to come here every day if I could. If it were closer, we could indeed come every day, one of them said. At the very least, if you become the CEO, we could afford to come here anytime, another added. Really, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, the subordinates handle all the work anyway. I want to become a CEO soon too, Larry added, thinking they were just among themselves, making some rather crude remarks. But when my mother appeared from the other side of the door and greeted them, the room went silent. Today, I will be in charge of serving you. Please let me know if you need anything, my mom said, bowing with perfect grace. There was a tangible tension among the family. However, when the food was served, they resumed their inappropriate discussions. Both my mother and I did nothing, simply watching as the plates emptied before them. It's great that we all could come. We got rid of the bothersome daughter-in-law, and the food is delicious. Perfect, one remarked. If you say that, she might get angry, you know, another cautioned. It's fine, she's not really one of us. To be honest, she never was. After all, it would be a shame to have a child from a single-parent family in our household, my mother-in-law said harshly. Hearing her mother-in-law's harsh words, my frustration boiled to an almost uncontrollable point. At that very moment, my mother entered the room with a dessert plate loaded with cake and fruit. Today, I've heard it's Miss Linda's birthday and also her wedding anniversary with her husband. When my mother asked where to place the cake for Miss Linda, the family looked at each other, confused. Nobody told you that, they mumbled. Excuse me, I'm the innkeeper, and I've clearly heard about it. Did Larry call? I didn't tell anyone, Larry muttered. There was an awkward silence, and the in-laws exchanged nervous glances. Finally, the mother-in-law raised her hand. I am Linda, she said, embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to mention it at my age, but thank you all for the surprise. Given that the only woman in the room was the mother-in-law, her reaction seemed appropriate. However, my mother just gave a faint smile, seeing her act. Hey, what's so funny? Is it strange to be surprised at my age? The mother-in-law asked. No, not at all. I wasn't thinking that, my mother replied. Then just bring the cake already, the mother-in-law demanded. Yes, but before that, there's something I'd like to share, my mother said calmly. I took a deep breath. Linda Harrison is my daughter. Everyone in the room looked shocked and raised their voices in surprise. Seeing an opportunity, I quickly opened the door from the adjacent room and stood next to my mother. Welcome, this innkeeper is my mother. It's a pleasure to meet you, I said. Larry exclaimed, Linda, why are you here? And what do you mean she's your mother? It means exactly that. This inn belongs to my family, and I also intend to take over this place someday, I explained. In truth, Larry had never met my mother before. Part of it was because my mother was busy with the inn, and Larry and his parents also insisted on not meeting her face to face. Larry had called me for our wedding introduction, but he never met her in person. 
I showed my mother a picture of Larry and explained who he was. It was an unconventional introduction, but I believed my mother had accepted him. From your earlier conversations, could you please refrain from mocking and belittling my mother for being a single parent? I asked. We just stated the facts, they replied. What's with the sudden drama? What grudge do you have against us? They continued. Neither Larry nor his mother nor anyone else seemed to realize the extent of the disrespect they had shown me. I was exasperated. I let out all the anger I had been holding back. If I have any grudges, it starts with you, Larry. I thought you were a good person when we got married, but it turns out you're too attached to your mom. You married me, so you should put me first, right? Don't team up with your parents to make fun of me. Larry was speechless, unable to argue against my points. My mother listened quietly to my outburst. Turning to my in-laws, I asked, Why do you treat me this way? If I'm such a nuisance, I can leave the Harrison family right now. You'll become a lonely, poor single woman, yeah? Are you sure about being alone? Both the mother-in-law and Larry sneered. Looking between my mother and me, I stared back firmly. It's okay, actually. I'm pregnant so I won't be lonely, and if I inherit this in, I won't have any financial worries. The truth was, I found out I was pregnant last week and hadn't told Larry yet. Only my mother knew, which is why she wasn't surprised. A child? What are you talking about? I haven't heard about this, Larry said, confused. Wait, Linda, if that's the case, it changes things. You should have told us sooner. Upon learning I was pregnant, the family immediately changed their attitude. I couldn't stand their unreliable and unreasonable behavior any longer and shouted again, no, my decision is final. Let's proceed with the divorce through lawyers. I will live happily with my child and my mother. Saying this, I opened the door to the hall they were in and left. The door slammed shut loudly. I'm done with this. My child will be happier without that family. Whether they tried to change my mind or not, I received over 45 calls a day from Larry and his parents. Eventually, I blocked all their numbers. A few days later, I received a letter from Larry informing me of our official divorce. The letter expressed his regret and pleaded for me to return, but I ignored it and tore it up. I thought he might neglect our child just like he prioritized his parents over me, and I absolutely didn't want that. Being alone and lonely will be your fate, not mine, I thought. He should enjoy his bachelor life. Currently, I am nurturing my child in my womb and discussing future plans with my mother. Once the child is born and grows a bit, I plan to send them to daycare and join the inn's business. The path to becoming the next innkeeper is long, but I'm determined to work hard to raise my child properly.